Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, uh, thank you all for coming. We are very happy to have with us Sung Hoon Kim, or Sung from MIT. He's a postdoctoral associate with Mike Ernst. Uh, prior to that, he actually earned his PhD from UCSC working with uh, Jim Whitehead. He's going to talk to us today about some of his work on predicting bugs by analyzing history. Thank you, Nachi. Um, thanks a lot for having me today. And uh, actually, I'm from Boston, and Boston is a great place to live. And uh, one small problem is and for six months, it's very cold, so you have to stay inside. So six months is a really nice time to make uh, some uh, papers, writing papers. It's a very productive time of the year. Here, Seattle is great. It's very, very nice weather today. And also, I'm very glad to be here. So I'm going to talk about the predicting bugs by analyzing history. So first of all, why I am so interested in predicting bugs? So usually, yeah. Sorry about that. Usually, bugs has really severe consequences. For example, in 1962, Marina One space probe, ha probe has a problem in their controlling software, and then because of that, it was uh, diverted in from the intended path, and then main control center has to destroy the uh, Marina 1 space probe. And similarly, in 1982, actually in Soviet gas pipeline, in their control system, there is a small bug. Because of that, inside of a pipeline, they have a backfire. So, and then it has a huge explosion. This explosion was recorded as the biggest non-nuclear explosion in our entire history because of a software bug. And similarly, 96, Ariane 5 flight machine has a bug inside. So basically, the problem was they tried to convert the 32 bit floating point number to integer. And then the number was overloaded. And because of that, at the 40 seconds of its launching, and it was exploded. So the point here is bug has re really severe consequences. However, the debugging process is really boring and very labor-intensive work. I'm not sure about you, but most people hate debugging. So basically what I want to do is I want to help developers to find the bugs in other bands so that maybe they can have easier time in their life. Then probably there are many other ways to find the bugs, but why I'm going to use history. So it's exactly the same reason why we are learning human history. So this great guy, actually George, has an amazing quote here. It captures the reason why we are learning human history. I think it's exactly the same for software developers. For example, here, software developers who cannot learn from software history are doomed to repeat it. So basic idea is we have the same mistake again and again, and then I don't want, we don't want to repeat it. So the one of the reason, one of the way is basically we are analyzing history and then see if there is the same mistake or not. So in fact, history can provide more than just finding a box. Here, let's say, what kind of information are available in history? Suppose uh, developers here, like Microsoft here, working really hard, and every day, they produce lots of data. I would call it it's basically raw data, and they create the specs, emails, and test cases, bug reports, and many, many data in everyday life. And then one of my research areas, I mine those data and turn those data to useful uh, history information. From this his history information, we can get a bunch of other things. For example, we can understand the software better, see how they are changing. And then also we can use this data for resource allocation. Which module has more problem? Which module we have to put more people? And then also we can see some change impact analysis using the history. When we change something this, and then in historical 
uh, data, what has happened. And also, we can do uh, bug prediction. So basically, what we can do is previously we see some bugs inside of the history, and then using that data, we can predict the future. And then hopefully, this data will be very useful for developers, and then we can provide some feedback to developers. So today, I'm going to talk about the bug prediction part using uh, software history. So before I get to my, my talk and my idea, let's talk about our dream as a software developers, what actually we want to achieve. So suppose this big rectangle here is an entire software system, and small dots inside is a module or file or something. And then our dream is, this, by the way, the green color is bug free module. So what we want to have entire bug free modules. So it's working perfect and it's very good. This is our dream. But unfortunately, this is not true in most cases, not Microsoft product, but most other software, it's not true. They do have lots of uh, hidden bugs inside, but most often it's a hidden, so we don't know until they show up. So it's a problem. Some modules are buggy. Even worse, when we make a change, suppose we, are, we need to change this module, which, which was clean, no bug inside. And then when we change, we introduce a bug. Here, for example, we change and then turn into the, a buggy module. So it happens in, in real development cycle. So basically, I want to help these two cases by introducing two algorithms. Today, I'm going to talk about the two algorithms here. So first one called the change classification. So basic idea is whenever we make some change in, in software, we try to predict either this change introduced a bug or not. The second algorithm is called a bug cache. What we want to do is we want to identify most bug problem modules in advance. So I'm going to talk about these two algorithms. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, interrupt me and ask some uh, questions if you have. So let's talk about the change classification first. So change classification, the idea is this. Suppose we have a development history of J80 text area, that's Java. And it has a revision one, and we made some change. Some people made a change, it goes to revision two and revision three. And then maybe as a developer, maybe we need another change, right? So some people gave us new specification or my boss said, you, you, you made some change here. So I made some change. And now it turns to revision four. And always as a developer, my question was, did I just introduce a bug in this change or not? So this is the most common question I had. So basically change classification one actually will answer these questions. Either you introduce a bug or not. Why this is important? Why knowing this is important? So what's going to happen if, if we know that a change is likely to introduce a bug? First of all, what you can do is you can review the submitted code very carefully. Because the change you made is just it's very, so, very fresh one. You made a change five minutes ago. It's not likely you change uh, some changes in a month ago or a year ago, you have no idea about the change. You just made a change, you can definitely see what is the problem, if there is a problem. But if you want, you can add more additional QA efforts, like learning more tests and then some more uh, inspections and so on. So I think knowing if a change will introduce a bug or not is a very important problem. So here is the overall idea of approach of how we do that. So from the history, what we can do is we can extract some change, and then we, know, we can figure out if this change was buggy change or not. So also, we can get another example. It's a clean change. We can extract from change. Also, we can have another changes, lots of changes from history. And then we feed those changes into machine learner. And then basically, you try to understand what's going on there. And then after that, if you have some unknown change, maybe you made one change, so it's a revision n to revision n plus one, then we ask machine learner, what is it? Is it either buggy or clean? This is overall approach of change classification. And quick summary of the result. So after have, have enough data, 
what you can do is you can classify all changes as a, a buggy or clean with 70% of recall and 94% of precision. So I'm going to talk about what is recall, what is precision later on. But the basic idea is as soon as we said it's a buggy, then 90% it's really buggy. 70% recall means we can capture about 70% about of bugs. We still miss 70%, 30% of bugs, but we still can capture 70%. So I'm going to show you how we achieve this uh, high precision and recall. So first job we have to do is we have to extract some historical data and then we have to label each changes. Either this is clean change or buggy change. So again, suppose we have a history data of the same file JD text area. And then now we go to revision 1 and 100, 101 and 102. So let's take a look 101 and 102 uh, closely. Here, we mark this one as a, with a bug. Actually, the, there's a, a method called set text with a special character tab. And then they fix it by adding insert to tab. So the problem here is a set text actually working pretty well. This is GUI program. They try to print out some text in uh, in the graphical environment, and then it works pretty well, but if you feed a special character tab, set text is not working. So they found the problem, and then they fixed by introduce new method called insert tab. They, they do special care over the tab, and then print out the tab. So how, do I, how did I find this fix? So basically what I did is by looking some change logs inside here, so most open source, we are actually looking at the edit open source project here. And most open source has very strong guideline about the change logs. So especially, they try to fix some bug. They're supposed to leave messages like this. They said, I fixed the bug, something, something. And then what we do is we have a link between the change logs and bug report. And we see the bug report and they see this is really bug, not uh, feature enhancement or so on. And then we mark this one as a, a fixed. So again, this is when the bug was fixed. It's not the bug was introduced into the system. So what we want to see is actually here a little bit carefully. And then we, we try to understand when those set text was introduced into the system. And then we mark those points as a buggy change. In order to see that, what we have to do is we have to track each lines of this limited 101 and then see when those lines was introduced into the system. So we developed some algorithm to track line changes. So currently, we are interested in revision 101. So we go back and go back and go back and then see which line was added when. So finally, what we get is called line origins. For example, here, line 1 was introduced in revision 12, and nothing has been changed. Line 3 was introduced in line uh, revision 23, and so on. So we try to understand when those lines are added into the system. So after that, let's get back to the example. After that, what we figured is this set text was introduced in revision 23. I have a quick question on the previous slide. When we actually delete it, wouldn't there be two line sixes? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Let's say we found another problem here, and then we mark it as a buggy, and all the rest we, we mark as clean. So we introduced this. OK, go ahead. So just one quick question. So um, when, okay, so when you have a revision that fixes a bug, okay. the lines that got replaced mm -hmm. could come from many different revisions, right? They could have been contributed over time from many different revisions. Right. Do you mark all of those as buggy? We, we mark all of them, but we try to see the last changes as a buggy. So that's another good question. Maybe there is some syntactical change, right? So suppose the, the set text tab was introduced, but later on they changed only white space, right? Then maybe we can we didn't find the origin source of the bug. Maybe we can check the last change, which is white space changes, right? Or some uh, formatting changes. But our uh, program is smart enough to ignore all white space changes and uh, indentation formatting changes. So try to identify the original problem as, 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 as accurate as we can. So we manually actually identified about 200 revisions, manually see which those labels. We manually inspect those labels and then see there are really uh, buggy changes. It turns out, it turns out about 95% uh, of uh, uh, marking was correct. About 5% is not correct due to the, some deletion of the uh, changes or some dependencies between changes. But still, we believe it's very accurate. And we uh, published this uh, algorithm 90 a seven, and then at least more than three papers actually using this algorithm or try to improve these algorithms slightly better. And how did you verify that the changes that you marked as buggy were actually the causes of the buggy changes? Did you actually, did you just read them all? Yeah, we read them. How many? 200, 200 changes, 200 cases. Just for this one file or for a whole bunch of files or for different projects? Or? Only we looking at the one project change here and then 200 revisions of all files. 200 file changes. As soon as we mark as buggy, we because uh, uh, actually we few people in our lab actually they have a, a more than five years of experience of writing program in Java. So definitely we are not domain expert of the program, but has some knowledge of what is the bug and what was the problem, and then carefully read the change logs and bug report, and then try to make sure either this change is really buggy. And then we found out about 95 percent are. Uh, reasonably, we marked correctly. That's what we found. But it's a very subjective uh, experiment. Yeah, what does clean mean? Clean, clean just means no bugs have been found. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Have you applied your algorithm to any uh, real world applications? Right. Yes. That's why I'm here, right? <laughs> um, we uh, apply this algorithm for the uh, Apple uh, software in the, in the Apple. And the Apple software has uh, like a much better marking of bug fixes than open source uh, software. Basically, they have a full like, a process. It's if, whenever they find a bug, they have to go some certain of, of procedures, right? And then they leave a special mark. So in that case, we, we get more accurate marking. So, OK, so how much do you need to, to train your machine? Uh, I didn't get there yet, but this is only marking stage. Uh, how much we need uh, data is we found out about uh, uh, 500 changes. If we have uh, more than 500 changes, we have a reasonable result, about 70-90% recall and precision. So we definitely need some sort of initial set of data. So let's say we just start a new project today, and then we have no history, then definitely we cannot use this technique. And so when an in, insert text was called with the uh, constant string for tab, and you had to replace it by a special one insert tab. But right. If it's called with a variable switch. Won't there, uh, input? Won't there be that general case where the source code just have to have a tab? And at that point, and the bug pops up with a different uh, way. Uh. Yeah, it's possible. Can you? I'm sorry, I I'm not sure I understand the question oh. correctly. If there is a variable, yeah, maybe that you you call insert or set text with a tab. Uh -huh. Because you knew that you had to indent so far on this page, but another fine, you're, you're copying a love letter that somebody wrote. You have to put a tab in it, and you call that same text 
thing with the 37th character of this line and it's a tab and something goes to foul. Uh, that's does it actually take into account tabs, alignment, etc., etc., changes in that? Right, right. Yeah, we, we take care of all the format changes as well, so it's not really... When there's a data file, and that particular character that happened to be a tab, constant originally, is now runtime dependent, will be processed properly. Uh, I guess if you have these tabs, etc., in, in, in fixed characters, I mean, like if you have a string, you print them. I mean, you have to be careful with the tab and, and, the, and the blank space. Sometimes blank space do matter with respect to program semantics. Is that possible? Um, right, definitely. If it is in, inside of a quotation, we don't remove any space inside of a quotation. But the other things, I think it's a feel free to remove spaces in the program. That's fairly safe. Uh, but here, this is actually a great example. As soon as you see set text and slash tab inside this kind of bug, and, and then in the history, actually, one guy found out the problem and they fixed it, and then two other guys actually came into the maybe new developer or another part, and then they didn't know about the uh, knowledge, and then they introduced the same bug two more times in J-Edit uh, uh, development history. So this is a great example. Yeah, is that? Answer your question, or maybe you can talk about in the offline. Later. Yeah, that's great. We're going to talk later about like the seventy percent, like the records of what happened bugs that you also. You're going to okay. address that later, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Now we we can label each changes as either clean or buggy, and the next job we have to do is we have to extract some features from change. What kind of uh, uh, features we can extract? So suppose we have a change here, revision ten and revision eleven. So obviously in change, there is some textual changes inside. So we can extract some textual information. And another thing we can think of is some metadata. So basically, who made this change? And then when this change was happening? Actually, it's either on early morning or later uh, afternoon, or Monday or Saturday, or something like that. OK, done. Um, typically, a uh, single check-in involves more than one change. And how do you, even if the developers are careful about labeling all of the bugs that they're fixing in a single check-in, how do you associate a bug with a particular delta files? Right. First of all, we take single change as one instance. We don't actually see all change sets together. We, we deal with a single change at a time. Also, we, we are very selective when we do our experiment. So for example, a guy said, I fixed the bug, and then he commit 100 files. Then it's kind of a trouble, right? But in our open source project, we'll take a look at mostly they're either commit one or two files at a time. So we try to select those projects. That wasn't the question I was asking. I was asking that frequently, at least around here, maybe not in this open source project, when people do a check-in, uh -huh. fixing several different problems at the same time. And so the change log that goes along with it will say, you know, fixing bugs such and such and then bugs such and such. Right. In that case, we don't have a really good way to uh, distinguish which bugs they fixed in, in which, which delta. So we just, uh, I just assume that all change, all, all delta in those commits are all fixed changes. That's what we assumed. So what do you define as such? Uh, it's very important. Yeah. It's, as you mentioned, maybe in one commit, developer can fix 10 problems, right? And then as the result, maybe he has 20 deltas. So the, the best way is if you can map between problem 1, delta 2, 3, and then problem 2, delta 6, 7, then it's a kind of ideal situation. But we don't have any data like that. So what we, I did is my assumption is if the change log says it's a fixed bug and bug numbers, then all change associated with those change are marked as a fix. And then we see when those fixed lines actually were introduced, and then we mark as change, uh, buggy changes. That's, only, uh, that's our assumption. We didn't have any way to di distinguish the changes. When you mark a change as buggy or clean, is that with respect to a particular bug number, or is that just 
it caused a bug and you don't actually care which? Uh, we don't actually care which kind of bugs or severity or something. As soon as they max is fixed, we, yeah. But then would it matter then if the check-in fixed 10 bugs because all of those fixes right. fix some bug. So right. it's just the notion that it fixes a bug is good enough for this analysis. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah. And then it, is it one bit of information? This this check-in is clean. This check-in is buggy, or is it a tri-state? You know, this is clean. This is buggy. This is we don't know which. So currently, we just have a we just mark the buggy changes first. And all the rest, we assume that there is no bug, which is not really true. But yeah, but but in our so here is another reason why we we can assume that a little bit in uh, comfortable ways. So also I did some study and how long it will take to find the bugs. It turns out about uh, one year to six months they can find the bugs. But here we used like about 10 years of history and then because of that reason we used the first part of the history. So that means most bug will be already they found. So that's kind of a little bit, uh, I'm not sure if you are comfortable with that but I'm, I'm a little bit comfortable to use that kind of data and then assume that most of the bugs actually, work, uh, actually are, are found. OK. And then, yeah, for the features, we the texture uh, format, and then some uh, metadata. So in summary of the features, we use the text features from program text and deltas and variables and file names and change logs. Also, software has a complex matrix. Basically, it gives us uh, how complex this software or this method is, this file is, and we use the complex matrix. Because we have two changes, we can see either this uh, changes goes to more complex way or less complex way. So we also use the complex matrix delta. And then a few uh, changes metadata, right? like author, and then uh, data, date and time of changes. So using this mechanism, what we can do is from historical data, historical changes, we can extract a bunch of vectors like this, and then we have labels. If these labels indicate either this change is clean or a buggy change. So we extract about 20,000 pictures of single change. Now this turns to like a, a very uh, standard machine learning problem set. So here we use the machine learning technique using Bayesian Net and SVM, we try to train this data. So after that, if we have a new change, what we do is also we extract some, some uh, features from new change and we try to predict either this is buggy change or clean change. And how we evaluate this? So in order to evaluate, we need a, a training set and test set. So we use the tenfold, pro, tenfold cross validation for that and then we try to get precision and recall which is the de facto standard to uh, measure the performance. So here is the thing. So we can predict either this change is buggy or clean. And the, in fact, we know the real label, so we can compare with the real label. In this case, it was correct uh, prediction. So this, from this prediction, we have uh, four outcomes from this prediction. Basically, suppose this is real buggy and clean change, and this is our prediction. Then what you can get is we can predict the real buggy changes as a buggy, and also we can predict real clean as clean, which is correct changes. And unfortunately, we can predict buggy as a, as a clean or clean as a buggy. So using these four numbers, what you can compute is precision here. Precision basically means all bugs here, either we uh, predict it correctly or not correctly. Uh, sorry. Uh, precision means whenever we said it's a bug, our predictor says it's a bug. And how many of those are really bug? So this is precision means, recall, no matter how we predict it's a real bug, how many you can catch. So recall means if there are 100 bug, and then how many you can catch is recall. This is we predict as a buggy, then how many are really buggy? This is precision. So after we compute this performance, what we did is some future selection uh, algorithm. We applied some future selection algorithm. This is uh, called a uh, backward wrapping approach. The basic idea is we start with a whole set of uh, uh, features and each iteration we remove 10% of features using 
uh, gain, gain ratio, and then we compute the performance. And then end of the day, we found the, the best set of features. And we, unfortunately, we don't have any uh, real easy way to access closed uh, uh, projects. So we used a lot of open source projects, including Apache, Eclipse, and Subversion, and Mozilla. And then we try to uh, get some recall and precision. So this is the result. So I think this is something remarkable here. If you see the, uh, let's say, which one do you like? Eclipse. Okay, you like Eclipse, I guess. And Eclipse, the first bar indicates recall. The second bar indicates precision. Here, precision is almost, almost 100%, which means whenever we said this change is likely to introduce a bug, 100% was sure. And then the recall is not very high. It's about 70, more than 70%. So that means we still miss some bugs, but it's good. Uh, so the average recall precision is about, uh, I told you people, so 74 to 94% average recall and precision. Well, the difference is that your system aside, um, that there are some pretty simple features that um, that describe, that capture, that characterize the vast majority of the bugs that are out there. And yet when I hear developers talk about bugs, it's, it's, it's a deep conversation. It's never a simple thing. It's never, this is buggy, that's, so, that's, that's clean. You know, it's way more nuanced. Bugs are really complicated. So, so I'm having trouble believing that, you know, between that that bugs can be characterized this kind of glibly. Right. You had a good point. If there is a new bug came in, and then we have no way to predict that correctly because we never seen that kind of bug before. That's why the recall is pretty, a little bit low. So in 30% in what we miss, maybe it's a new bug we never seen. But for the example I gave you, the set text with a special character tab, whenever we, start the, we see the, the, those patterns, we can say it's buggy, and then that's why we have a, a little bit high precision. So we saw some buggy problem before, and then as soon as we see that, we can predict it as a buggy. So it's the same as, it's also, it's a, you have not already uh, noticed, it's, this is it's a binary prediction, not really we provide, we give you some comprehensive examples, right? This is binary, I can say either good or not. It's a very easy prediction. Uh, also, let's say, you are working for uh, a project for five years, and then you know the old history of the, uh, of the software development, and then you understand the system of so many cases. Just let me finish this one, and then I'll get to get you. And then you have knowledge about the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the software, and then suddenly a new guy came in, and he made some change. Then as a, or like a senior developer, maybe you can give some idea this is good change or not immediately, right? So basically, I want to capture that kind of knowledge using this uh, technique. OK. So is this for all of the versions of each piece of software that you retrieve from the repository? So we, we, uh, we tried only first the top 1,000 revisions for this experiment because of the reason that we couldn't find all the bugs in the, for, the, for the current version. So we gave them some time. Uh, to find the box. So what was the difference between the training set and the set you used for evaluating? So currently we use the 10 uh, uh, fold cross validation. Basically we chop, uh, we get the, uh, we get the instances, changes, and then we just select the top, uh, we put in the 10 different fold, and then we use nine fold as a training, and then one fold as a testing. But also we did some experiment with uh, what's called online or uh, incremental learning. Basically we used the first one to n revision for testing for the training and then the n plus one as a, as a testing and then we get a very similar result. So one of the reasons why we used the 10 fold cross validation is we try to identify some more important features and less important features to understand why people make the same mistake and what kind of features are the dominant one to predict the bugs. Okay. Um, I guess I have two questions. One, hopefully you'll get to this. You'll tell us which of the features actually turned out to be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second one is for the thousand check-ins for each of these different projects that you looked at, 
did it matter what time period those thousand changes were like and, and where they were with respect to a, a product release? Okay. So let me get the first question. What is the most important uh, features? So this is actually very interesting thing to see. But we, we're dealing with about 20,000 features. I think number, not number one, but uh, one of the top important features are authors, which who actually made the change is important one. And another one we found is like some special condition. So if you use if condition with a special variable, we are making more bugs because maybe uh, the variable has maybe maybe people on, ha, have hard time to understand the variable, the semantic of variable correctly. So whenever they use the if, maybe they forget something. It's kind of a stuff and this, and so on. And the second question, I'm sorry, I forget the second question. <laughs> was um, you collected 1,000 check-ins um, for each of these uh, uh, projects. That could have been any time period in the history of the project, you know, before some point in the present. Did it matter whether those 1,000 check-ins overlapped with a product release? And could it be different before or after a release of a version of the product? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. But unfortunately, in our open source, when we uh, looking at their history, we didn't actually uh, take account for the release point or major revision or something. So we just take all changes as just a simple change. So we don't have any data like that. I think it's very interesting to see if any major release will affect this kind of a, a result. Thank you. I was just curious, so for each of these thousand check-in, how okay. many of them are buggy? Uh, it's about 20 to 30 percent are buggy. It's a really good question. Since this is binary uh, classification, maybe you can say all change is buggy or all changes. Maybe randomly we can say and how much we can achieve the precision. Maybe recall, in terms of recall, we can achieve 100% recall by predicting all changes as a buggy. But precision, we cannot do better than 20, 30% precision. Okay, this is 90, 100% precision, it's much better. System, uh, this project. Do you test it on the entire project or only test on one of the files in the project? The entire, we did the first 1,000 changes. Well, on the, no matter what file it is. Yes, we didn't, we didn't take in the, what so kind of file. Uh, on the history of one file, you can still apply the same learning machine to other files. Oh, that's actually another interesting point. If you can run some specific bug patterns in, in different files. We didn't actually do that, but we collect all changes. From one file or all, all project. From, from all project in, from yeah, all project in one, one project. But it seems like it's a good idea to, um, to try to understand the common bug patterns of each single file. I think it's, yeah. But we didn't do that. Currently, we, we collect all changes from one project, no matter what kind of file they change, who change it. Um, so you, your input set of features is 20,000. How many do you select? Uh, after selecting, we get about 4,000 features. Turns out the best set of the features. It's very between project and project. Are, they, are there common trends uh, between projects? Uh, actually, the feature selection work was very recent to work about a month ago, two months ago. So we didn't actually, we were in the process of understanding so select the features, and then I don't have answers yet. It's a good question. Anyway, wow, it's a lot of question. Thanks a lot. Um, OK, we compared with our approach with others. So in 2007, Mizuno et al., actually, they introduced a uh, technique that they use a spam filtering program and try to identify either this change or this file is buggy or not by training that. And then there, a best recall and best precision is about the 51 to 59. They are best ones. And then, and then Abasuno et al. did a, a change classification. It's similar to ours. And they extract only textual method, textual features from uh, source code. And their best precision and recall is about 59%. In our case, in our average recall precision is 70 to 94%. Those two papers? Actually, we don't have really benchmark, but here and here we have uh, the same set of project like Eclipse. We do have the same, but we have uh, like a third, 
12 open source projects, but they did only two, three, three, four, something. So we are like a, a superset of their uh, experiment. What was the variance? Sorry, once again. What was the variance in across the benchmarks in terms of the 70, 90? I guess you showed you showed the, the, the graph, right, right. But how different was each project? I think uh, one of them they use the Eclipse, for example. When our Eclipse is out performs than average, so it's, a, it's a better than average. Our Eclipse, they use the Eclipse. I guess it would work better if, in, if in your plots you included only the two, three projects and made this. Uh, yeah, then it will be the better than average. Yes, definitely. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, in summary of the change classification. We use the machine learning algorithm at the training. We can predict about 70% uh, uh, recall and 94% precision of either changes clean or buggy. I think this is really uh, applicable in real development process. For example, uh, developer may be making some changes, commit to the, their uh, SCM system, and as soon as the SCM gets some their changes, what it can do is we can run this analysis and send some feedback if we think it's a, it's a buggy change. Also, maybe you can embed this thing to the editor level, like Eclipse or Visual Studio. And then whenever we are monitoring some changes, and then whenever we feel like this change goes uh, to, will likely introduce some bugs. Maybe you can change some background color slightly and something. And currently, Yahoo and Apple are interested in uh, using this technique in their development process. Hopefully, Microsoft will be the same. We'll see. Um, the next, I will talk about the bug cache algorithm. Again, the bug cache, what I want to do is I want to solve this problem. So some modules are more buggy than other modules, so I want to identify those modules in advance. So why this is important? So because always our money and time is limited. So we want to identify which file we should focus on first. So I've been told that in Windows 2003 team here, and they have a binary list called escrow list. And manually, they maintain those escrow lists. And then as soon as developer make some changes on those binaries, they have to go some certain level of uh, code inspection. Uh, they ma manually, ident manually maintain those lists. Why they manually maintain those lists? Why they didn't go? to deep analysis for the all binaries because they have always limited time. So they want to do some special care for most bug upon uh, binaries. But here is the same. The idea is we want to maintain or we want to identify those files automatic way. So this is kind of a hot area in our research. So a lot of people try to identify where are the bugs. So few findings. People said in new files, as soon as you create a new file, then we'll have more bugs in it. And then other people find out here, and in modified files, if you have a, a, if you change the file, then you will have a bug. And uh, Chimaman actually found another interesting thing, the special locality. We, we found the bug in here, and the nearby files, either uh, by call relationship or code change relationship, will have a bug. And Ostrand et al., they found out that a temporal locality. So, we fix a bug, but you think we fixed the bug, but in fact there are more bugs inside of those files. So it's a kind of, kind of temporal locality. So our solution is basically we want to want to have a list again, and then also dynamically I want to adapt, di dynamically update the list as a, as a, we project goes on, and then also I want to use the previous foundings together. So our idea is using cache. So basically we have a list of area we call it cache. Hopefully, we will have most book from files inside of the cache. So here is the quick summary of the bug cache. So 10% of bug cache means usually we hold only 10% of file inside of our list. And those 10% file, using those 10%, we can predict about 73 to 95% of bugs. So if you see that, if you are monitoring only 10%, you can catch about 80% of bugs. It's a good good deal, I think. So how we do that? This is high level view of the bug cache operation. So suppose we have all files in here in the system. Each dot here indicates a single file. So first of all, we have an area called cache. It's a list. 
So mostly we have 10% of the entire system. And as soon as one, we found the bug inside of the file. And then here, our cache list is, is empty. So we didn't predict it correctly. And then in this case, we load this file into the cache. So we believe those files will have another bug soon. So we load it. When we load this file, not only this file, we also look around nearby files, and then we load them all together. Here, in our experiment, nearby means code changes. We load into the cache. And after that, we believe the least files in the cache, we believe that they are most focal form files. And after a while, we believe some files in there is not any longer dangerous, we basically replace. This is high level view of the bug cache. I'll give you some example here. Suppose we have a cache size is only two, and this is development history. So as time goes on, we will, have a, we will see some changes, and some changes with the bug fix. Here, let's say, let's go, here we are. We have a, a file change, it's not a bug, it's a, a clean change, so it's, a, it's good. And then B, clean change. And then now we have a C, a fixed change. So in this case, what happened was, so we, our, our list was empty, so that means we didn't predict there is a bug in C file, so we missed it. So basically, we, want, uh, we missed it first, and we want to load this C inside of the cache. This is the basic operation. So here, how we update the cache. So I might have missed something, but is bug cache a tool, like a developer tool, or is this just a program you like to run, or? Like this is algorithm. algorithm. This is just an algorithm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, if there is a miss, we just load the missed file into the cache. It's simple. And not only this file, we also load some nearby files. Here again, nearby means a code change. So here, we want to load C into our cache. Then we compute how many files are changed with C, A, B, and A and B, C, and so on. So in this case, B file has been changed the most with the C. So we believe the B is the nearby file. And then we load C and B at the same time, because we believe B is the most uh, close one. And then we move along. Next, we have a change of the C. In this case, we are very lucky, because we already predict C will have bug, and then Indeed, they have bugs. So in this case, it's hit. Our prediction was correct. And then we go on A, just a change. And there is another good log here. It's B, another hit. So it's good. And then we move along. And then A now have a bug. We missed it because A was not in the list. So here, we want to load A into the system. So the problem here is we don't have enough space. So we have to decide which one we should be replaced. So we come up with uh, some uh, few heuristics. First of all, called RLU, and the second one is called change. The last one called bug. Basically, we see the metrics of each file, and then we decide which one we should replace. So suppose the bug means we see how many bugs in each file, and then we replace the list of uh, frequent defects. Suppose we are using the bug as our uh, replacement policy, and what we C is like a C and B. Either one of these will be replaced, and then we see a number of bugs, and then we decide to replace B. Because B has only one bug. And after that, we have a C and A in our list. So we believe the C and A will be the most bug front files for the, for the next changes. So this is how bug cache works, and then how we evaluate, how this is you know, predicted well or not well. So idea is we used hit rate here. So basically, how many bugs and how many we predict them correctly. So in this case, error, uh, we had only 50% of a hit rate. It's clear. The timeline of the line, are those check-ins or some other? Okay. Yes, it's check-ins. And this one is it's a, a bug fix. And bug fix is based on the predictor you talked about previously. Right, the change logs. So you, you basically look at the change log for each check-in, and that tells you whether there was a bug or not, based right. on whether there was the word bug in the text right. or something. Right. So basically, you're predicting uh, bug fixes, which means already there is bug. So if I understand correctly, 
bug cache is a small subset of the total system that yes. is most likely to contain bugs based on the revision history you've seen so far. Yes. That's and so therefore, that's probably where I want to spend my like, testing budget or whatever. Right, mind. right, correct. So for example, we are having only 10% of the list. And if you can find 90% of future bug in those 10%, it's great, right? Only or by monitoring 10%, we can capture on 20%. It's not good. So that's the one of the purpose of why we perform some experiment. Here, again, we uh, use the open source project and then see what is the performance of the bug cache. So the cache size is 10% of all files. And then this is the result. So basically here, so version 7 is 3% to about 95%. So that means by having only 10% of the files, we can predict this much of bug. Do you have any questions? Where does 10% come from? Uh, right. Uh, it's not static analysis. We actually had a, a, some grab by uh, 10 to 100% of the cache and then percentage of the hit rate. We found that 10% is the most uh, efficient percentage. So it, it goes 20%, but we cannot double the hit rate. For example, yeah. Could you, could you have the miss rate? Uh, could could I have miss rate? Yeah, I mean, when you get up above fifty percent, look at the miss rate instead of the hit rate. Get a hit rate. Uh, miss rate is like exactly one minus hit rate, right? Right. You can yeah. have the, you can conceivably, when you're at eighty-two percent, you can conceivably have the miss rate, but you can't double the hit rate. Oh, I see. Yeah, we can double the hit rate, but we cannot also. Uh, reduce the half of the, the, the miss rate by increasing 20%. So we found 10% is the, the efficient way. But uh, if, if your budget allows, maybe you can monitor 20% or 5%, only 10 files, whatever you can decide. Um, two questions. One, you said you looked from cash sizes of 10% to 100%. What about like 0.01% to 1%? I mean, like, or less. You know, if you've got a project with a couple hundred thousand files, 10% is still a lot. Right, right. So actually, basically, we start from 0 0.0 to 100%. But the graphs looks like it slowly goes up. And then 10% kind of maximum. 10 to 20% is kind of maximum. And then kind of steady. So that's what we see. Maybe it's a, maybe 0 0.1%. Maybe it's about 20%, 30%. But still, we gain something. But yeah. Why are you I have a graph in, in the. Why are you talking about hit rates rather than precision and recall in this case? Uh, Right, precision and recall is important, but uh, I believe hit rate is more definitely we have to, yeah. I, I, I think this, this is giving up the false naked tips, right? Right, part, right. right. part which is precision, right? Um, um, no. Hit rate is recall. Right? Yeah, hit rate is recall. So what about precision? So How here. How many positives do you have in this platform? Right, I think, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let's say we have like some some modules inside of the list, but never one file in the list doesn't have any bugs. It's kind of a false positive, right? But we didn't actually measure precision and recall. I think it's interesting to see precision and recall. Yeah, I, I haven't thought about that. But basic idea is we monitoring 10%. How many, how much bug we can capture by monitoring 10% of bugs? So that's why we came up a hit rate, and also. In this kind of a work, most people see that kind of hit rate as their performance measure. So the goal, one of the goals is I want to compare with this work with others. I will, I will get uh, to that point. You introduced three cash replacement strategies. Which one is this? Oh, OK. So different project has a slight different uh, options. Some project actually works, works better. And some, some project, LRU, works better. So basically, this uh, we get the, the best performance by changing the uh, options, especially the block size is also option, right? How many we load the nearby ones? So it's a, it's a very, but mostly the bug uh, performs better than others. Number of previous Here are the best of the best. Yes, best of the best. But it's about the five to ten percent difference if you uh, use some sort of a fixed set. So the next kind of goal is how we can find automatically the best sets of options.
How stable is the cache? I mean, is it the case that three modules are just always in the cache, and those are the three you should always test and ignore the others? Right. We we studied how it's kind of a turn. What is called uh, in the in the system, there is some maybe turn out rate or something, and then it turns out like uh, about the sixty percent of of of, of a program it stays a very long time. About forty percent kind of a in and out, in and out, kind of stop. Yeah. Um, so, I'm, so what does precision mean here? I mean, maybe the better, better way to think about it is you want to look at the cache hidden cache from this one. Right. Um, I'm not quite sure if precision makes sense to measure here. What would it mean to measure precision? What's the number? So basically precision, here a hit rate is in some sense very similar to precision. With, um, we predict 100 files in our cache, and how many of them are really, or in time goes on, has a bug, right? So if there, the bug was found inside of the cache, we are happy. But we, what we didn't, what we, we don't really measure is like a false uh, positive, right? So we believe the file A will, be, will have lots of bug, but maybe no bugs. Yes, yeah, well, no bug at all, but we, we didn't actually measure how many files of this case inside of the case. We didn't measure that. Yeah, yeah. But it's, I think it's very interesting to see how those kind of falsified. We spent a lot of time, but we, we couldn't find any bugs inside. Right. So lots of questions. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And then also I compared with other work here. Uh, Copo et al. They used the top ten percent using. Uh, Object complex metrics, I guess. They used the object complex metrics and they identify top top ten percent of most bug prone. And there they said sixty-four percent they can catch using those top ten percent. Hassan et al. also they used the top ten percent using uh, number of previous bug, number of previous changes, and then they can identify forty-four to seventy-eight percent. Again, we used the seven open source projects, mostly they used the one or two. So we are like a superset of them. And then our 10% can, can predict 73 to 95%. So in summary, previous state of the art, 10% can predict 44 to 78. We can predict 73 to 95%. So it's good. Uh, using these two algorithms, I can, I'm very comfortable to conclude that analyzing history is an effective way to predict the bugs. I introduced the two. Successful algorithm, change classification, and per cache. So any other questions? I'm going to move to the uh, research overview and future work. If you don't have any question about the per cache or change classification. Well, I guess I'm trying to, so when, you're, when you did this comparison with the other existing work, mm -hmm. how many of those other schemes are like a caching scheme? I'm trying to figure out in your bug cache system, what are the original contributions from you here? Is the idea of having a cache something that no one else has tried before? Is it the cache policies that are new? Or what? how much of it is new? So it's a, the idea of having cache is very new. Pre previously, a lot of people tried to extract some metrics of each files, and then either they, uh, they learn some linear pro progression, li linear regression algorithm, and then get some equation like Like this. That's what they get, and then, and then they try to get some predictions. But here, per cache is very simple algorithm, and then we understand why those files inside of the cache, and it's adaptive, and it captures all bug occurrence modules. We used all previous modules at the same time, but yet it's a very complex model. If you try to uh, write the equations of like this kinds of per cache operation, it's very complex. But intuitively, we understand why it's OK. I have a so okay. it seems to me if you took your first technique, the, the prediction based on uh, machine learning, uh, you could select the modules that had bugs in them just by watching the change log and making the predictions and saying, yes, you're in, yes, you're out, yes, you're in, yes, you're right. out. Um, would that not? 
lead you to get a more accurate prediction of which 10% of the files you should take a look at just by counting the number of occurrences that you make right. the prediction? Yeah, that's a good question. I think maybe combining these two techniques will lead more better accuracy. But the first, if you understand uh, the first change classification, our target is not try to identify some burger foreign files or modules. We take each change individually. So even though one file maybe has lots of bugs. Right, change tells you which files change. So you can quite easily label the files as being involved in the change that's bugged. Right, right. That's, that's true. But the one kind of a, uh, limitation of the bug cache kind of work, even though we are dealing with very bug from modules, bug from files, not all changes are buggy. Some, only some changes are buggy. So the first work is try to identify those kind of changes. But the second work is if you have like a, a limited resource, I'm going to show you some examples of bug cache, how we use the bug cache in real practice. But, uh, we have some limited resource, which file or which module we have to spend more time than the bug cache is the algorithm. And then either developers make lots of changes and they want to see which change we have to see more carefully than change classification in the algorithm. Definitely, I see some common themes between these two algorithms. OK. So. So my research goal over, overall is uh, developer productivity. I really want to help developers. And also, in the same time, I want to have a reliable software. So my current focus is, is uh, predicting bugs, but eventually I will get into the, all the, my uh, entire goal. So let's talk about what I did uh, so far. So I have uh, like a two big chunk of work, static world and dynamic world. The first work. Uh, actually in static area, it's a history mining. So basically try to use history to get some useful information. So we developed a, a tool called the Canyon, uh, and basically it extracts all changes from SCM system. Sometimes it's getting data from SCM system. It's not really easy. So Canyon actually take care, automatically extract all changes. And then later on, inside of a Canyon, we developed an algorithm called how we, how we identify bug and reducing changes. So we developed that algorithm. And then FSC, uh, last year, we developed an algorithm called uh, to prioritize the warnings. Here is an interesting work, I think. Uh, find the box or some other static analysis tool can provide some warnings of your source code. For example, if you feed 1,000 line of source code to find the box, find the box basically give you 500 warnings. So, so the problem is always we don't know which one you should look because too many false positives. So what I did using history is we observe all warnings of, the, of those uh, uh, during the history. And then I, I try to understand, understand what's going on there. For example, some warnings appeared into the history and then removed very quickly. And then the same type of warning appeared and removed very quickly. Then maybe the warnings are important or people care about the warnings. But some warnings that appeared, and in one year, two years, just stay into the system. Nobody cares. Maybe those bugs are really hard to find, but more likely people don't care about the warnings. So based on this assumption, we try to reprioritize all warnings, and it turns out it's a very effective way to do that. So that's like a rating system. For yes. You're basically looking at customers' behavior, and you're saying customers prefer these type of warnings. Or right. To yeah, exactly. Yeah. But our, our, yes, yes. Our assumption is that the people are not using the bug finding tools in their development history. So it's not really using that. But still, they can find some certain kind of bug they do care and they do less care. So we try to capture those kind of ratings. And so the understanding, I try to understand how signature are changing or pattern of the program is changing. And bug prediction part, I give you Two examples of uh, change classification and bug cache today. And another work is called uh, Memories of Bug Fixes. Uh, the basic idea is whenever there is a bug fix, we try to extract some syntactical patterns of those fix and those bugs. And then as soon as we identify uh, each change as buggy using change classification, then what we can do is we can provide some examples. Not only saying this is buggy, we try to provide some examples 
For example, we already saw the set text with the tab as marked as a buggy, and then the corresponding fix is this. Would you like to consider whenever people try to introduce set text with tab? <coughs> In the dynamic world, actually, uh, I did a work called the recrash. The basic idea is producing the crash or producing the problem is hard, so I try to capture all program running and then try to reproduce the problem. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the recrash later on. So another work is called the zero-day patch. So what we did is dynamically, we run some program and then try to understand or try to learn some invariance of those learning program and then we save into the database. And then the same instance is running and then maybe get some virus or get attack or in bug. If we crash, what we can see is where we crashed, where the program crashed, and then we try to extract some invariance of those crashed part and then see what has been different. If you found some differences in invariance, what you can do is you can create a patch automatically. The patch means basically we fix the invariance. And then we send the rest of the instances, and then as soon as they get attacked, hopefully the fix works out, and then it's not actually get the same attack or get the same bugs. We had a, a test with a Firefox program, and it turns out it works pretty well. And for the future work, what I'm going to do if I get a job. So first work is uh, trying to build some change classification aware SM system. And change classification actually had a, a, a few problems. First, a big problem is the source of labeling. So whenever we label, we have some difficulties. For example, if developers submit 100 changes at the same time and then mark as fixed, and we, we don't know which one is really fixed. So in this SM system, what we can do is as soon as developers make some changes, we can, we can mark which change is really corresponding to the really fix or really bug. So you can identify real bugs and real fix correctly. And then as soon as we have some commits, we can send some feedback to the developers. Another one is a personal coding assistance. So author is one of the important uh, features to identify either this change is buggy or clean, so which means a lot of people or the same people make the same mistakes or same kind of mistake. So I want to understand what is my common error patterns we learning by developers and provide some, some uh, useful information to each developers. And then I can mine more uh, bug reports and crash reports here. And then also, I found that some APIs, people have very much difficulties to using some type of APIs. Whenever they use that API, they make lots of mistakes. So I want to understand more why people make more mistakes using that API, and then get some lessons. And then as soon as we use the same type of API, we, we give them some information. So last of all, uh, I want to combine some complementary techniques here. I already see a lot of people here working on dynamic and static analysis together and combining these two things together. So in my case, I can combine with mining technique and static analysis technique and dynamic analysis. I'll give you a brief example of combining static and dynamic analysis and also the example of, of bug cache use. So I think you understand very well what's the, the limitation of a static and dynamic analysis here. Static analysis basically has very low overhead. We don't have to run program. So basically we read the source code or binary code. But it has, a, unfortunately, has a very high rate of false positives. On the other hand, the dynamic analysis has very low false positives because we learn program and then as soon as they crash or there is some problem, it's likely to real problem. But overhead is really high, so most times it has a limitation. So the idea is why we don't, don't we combine these two techniques together. For example, here, bug cache is a little bit static analysis technique try that to identify most bug from files first. And then recreate this dynamic analysis part. So I'm going to show you some examples how we combine these two techniques together by introducing recreate first. Why I'm working on recreate? Because reproduce, reproducing crash is hard. So in most cases, we need a, a exact uh, configuration of the client in order to reproduce. Sometimes it also involves some non-deterministic facts. So we, there is no guarantee that we can reproduce the problem. But however, we have to reproduce the problem in order to fix the bug. And after the fix, we have to validate, right? We, we fix it correctly. So you have to reproduce the problem to validate and fix bugs. 
So it's a hard problem. So we, we introduce, we uh, develop a tool called the Recrash. If there is a subject program, what Recrash does is we monitor each subject program, each method calls inside of the subject program. And then as soon as the subject program crash, what Recrash does is generate some unit test cases. So this unit test cases basically reproduce the original problem. So it works well, and then I'm using uh, this request in my daily development process. The only problem, uh, one problem of the request is it has a very high performance overhead. It's about the 13 to 64% overhead. Perhaps this is okay for uh, research purposes, or maybe it's okay for debugging purposes, but definitely nobody wants to use this kind of uh, 13 to 64% slow Microsoft Word, right? They don't want to use it. So why this is, has high performance overhead? We did uh, uh, all things we can do, like we did uh, immutability analysis, point to analysis. We tried to save the minimal set of, uh, of methods, but still it's very high. So why? Because currently we monitor all modules. Suppose this is um, a module here. We basically recreation monitor all modules. Let's say we have some sort of static analysis tool, like a bug cache. We can identify most crashable method in advance. So you can identify, identify those method in advance. And then we combine these two things together. We only monitor those identified ones. Suppose our 10% of module accounts for 70% of crashes, like a bug cache. Then what we can do is by combining these two, we can run recrash plus bug cache with only 1 to 60% of overhead. But still, we can reproduce 70% of crashes. This is one example of using combining two, two techniques together. Also, example of using bug cache. So before I summarize my talk, I'd like to thank my two excellent advisors from UCS, HMITED, and Mike Ernest and MIT. Also, I have, I have a privilege to work with many, many talented co-authors. I really enjoyed and had lots of fun working with them from MIT, UCSC, Southern University, Iowa, and industry, and UTOP. And then definitely I'm eager to work with new collaborators, leaders like, like you here. And in the summary, so box has really severe consequences. It's a really, uh, we lose lots of money and even lives, but it's still it's very hard and boring to debug. And I try to help developers by predicting bugs. So the first one is change classification. As soon as there is a change, I can say this change is likely to introduce a bug or not with very high precision. And second one is called a bug cache. We can identify most bug problem modules using this algorithm. And for the future work, I have a lot of work to do. And one example is combining uh, some static and dynamic analysis together. Thank you very much. Any more questions, concerns, and comments? Sure, yeah. All my old papers are online, so you can download it. So um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can give you the website. Yeah. I'm always the Windows library. The Actually, you know, the, the lecture hasn't finished yet. Once I finish, the recording is still going on. So oh, okay. No problem. no problem. Thanks a lot. Any more questions? I just right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Now we finished. <laughs>